start the evening off, I'd like to call on our little Martingale to sing a good old British love song for all us homesick lads. <laughs> And welcome to the Final Ghost Podcast. I'm Anna. Today, we take a little detour from our series dedicated to exploring witches on screen to bring you a bonus episode about the new film by director Jennifer Kent, The Nightingale, released in UK cinemas today. I'm a huge, huge fan of Kent's first feature, The Babadook, and jumped at the chance to talk about her bold new film and excitingly also interview the lead actress of The Nightingale, Ashlyn Franchosi. Set in 1825 Australia, Franchosi plays Claire, a young Irish convict woman who is desperate to be set free of her abusive master, Lieutenant Hawkins, played here by Sam Claflin. A sadistic British officer who refuses to release her from her sentence. Claire suffers a harrowing crime at the hands of the lieutenant and his cronies, and unable to secure justice from the British authorities. Beset by grief and rage, Claire decides to pursue Hawkins and enlists the help of a young Aboriginal tracker named Billy, played by newcomer by Kali Ganambar who leads her across hostile terrain. Now this is an episode in two parts. Firstly, I'm joined by Watershed cinema producer Tara Judah to discuss the film and how it portrays the pain, anger and injustice of Australian history. Now there are no strict spoilers in this conversation, but please be warned that there is discussion of rape and sexual violence. Tara has also produced a video essay that looks at Kent's intention and the influence of the coverage in the film on how it's being received. I'll link to it in the show notes. While The Nightingale is not strictly a horror film, it is a horrifying watch. It's a confronting, brutal exploration of violence and trauma. And the entire film is very much anchored by its sleep performance. In the second part of this episode, you'll hear my interview with Ashling Franchosi to discuss her role, working with Jennifer Kent, and the responsibility of portraying trauma on screen. We don't want no trouble. That's just the way, isn't it? You don't want trouble, but sometimes trouble wants you. There I sit and cry. Tara, thank you so much for jumping in and talking about The Nightingale with me. It's a film that I knew was going to be controversial because I'd heard people talk about it already. And I try to keep my expectations as clean and open as possible because I love Jennifer Kent and the work she'd done before. But um, I wanted to get your take on the film. So what did you know about it before watching it? And what was your initial reaction to the film? Yeah, so I think it's fascinating, actually, to think about these films that are released where they have a life before they're released. So um, definitely, I was already looking forward to the film, like you say, for the same reasons. I loved The Babadook by Jennifer Kent. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I was really keen to see what she was going to do next. She's a really impressive and interesting filmmaker. So I already had that on the one hand of my expectation. On the other, I knew that it had caused quite a stir um, when it played in Venice, that the film festival, um, after the film screened, an Italian critic had started swearing at her and called her a whore. And uh, there was a whole thing around him having to apologize and, you know, being outraged by the film. Apparently, when it screened in Australia at the Sydney Film Festival, people walked out of the screening. There was, so there was a lot of this like, oh, the film's really controversial. Um, so whenever those things are kind of out in the ether before you get a chance to see it, you you already go in with a, a I guess, a kind of it's loaded. You know, you know that something there's something uh, really kind of extreme about this film. So I already had that that in the back of my mind. What I knew was that it was going to be really violent um, in terms of sexual violence and also in terms of the violence of invasion, which is the story of Australian history. Having grown up in Australia, I'm no stranger to that. I know it really well. So I was prepared for the level of violence in the film. And I will actually say that I think the level of violence in the film is appropriate for the story that it is telling. I don't think in any way that she is glorifying, gorifying, or taking the violence as some kind of entertainment factor or for titillation. All of it is absolutely key to the truth of the story that she is telling. The one thing, however, that I wasn't prepared for, and it's only because I just had a baby before watching this film, is that 
no one told me something happens to a baby. So I was prepared for the violence and the sexual violence. Um, but there is also something that happens to a baby in this film that I found actually probably the most distressing thing, uh, which is completely because I've just had a baby myself. But I would definitely say that even that, even that, which I found so difficult to watch and was really, you know, piercingly painful, um, is actually relevant because the way she sets up the narrative and the story in the film, um, it, 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 you have to be that invested. It has to be that horrific for you to completely understand why the characters are motivated the way that they are. Um, and the kind of ecology of how different characters treat each other, because the film is absolutely 100% in my opinion about not so much, Oh, the violence was really extreme, but what causes violence and what allows violence? So it's this question for me around every single time anything violent takes place or anything untoward takes place in this film, there's actually always someone who could have stopped it or there's always other people watching or there's always other people bearing witness to these events and this uh, maltreatment of others. And so this, which really is the story of the face-to-face -face encounter, Australian history absolutely 100% is all about what happens when humanity sees itself and is there a point at which we can say we would never allow atrocities to happen. And the point of Australian history is that that's not what happened. The atrocities did take place. So it has to be that brutal in the telling of the story. I think, unfortunately, as hard as that might be to kind of watch, on the one hand, it's an incredible film because it tells a really urgent, important story, not just for Australian audiences, but I think also for really for British audiences who don't know the history maybe as well, um, but also for international audiences because a lot of the time these stories kind of get lost and, and people don't really know that, you know, they make jokes about Australia as a penal colony, oh, you're all convicts, et cetera, et cetera. It's like actually people really need to know what that invasion um, that we, we – you know, quite often white people call settler history. They need to know what that's about. Mm. I completely agree with you. Kind of in a similar way to you, I was expecting there to be violence. And it was sort of a film when it first started getting reviewed during its festival premieres and runs. A lot of the controversy and the discourse that started coming out, as you said, was kind of about how horrific it was. And there was the question up in the air because of Jennifer Kent's previous breakout hit, The Babadook, about whether it was going to be a horror film that kind of used the genre to tackle Australian history and kind of colonial history and systemic violence. It is categorically not a horror film. It is horrific to watch, in my opinion, but that doesn't detract from the need to showcase that violence. And the thing that actually was really striking to me, to echo what you were saying, was the indifference and the systems in place and the apathy of people for one reason or another. Different characters behave when they see and allow violence to happen to other people and to the lead character in particular. But you can you can see that that is just one story. One story is an example, and you can extrapolate that to so many others. And she herself, as a perpetrator of violence, you can also see how she allows other aggression to happen against other people as well, namely um kind of the her kind of companion through this kind of rage road trip that she goes on to. What did you think about her as a character in particular? I mean, I thought the character was really fantastically drawn and, and actually, again, really true to the history is that, first of all, one of the things that's incredibly important to understand is that um, the kind of what we call, you know, the British Empire is that there were, there, there are countries within Britain um, and they were at war and there were prejudices and there were class structures and all kinds of things going on that also complicate this idea of um, just this, this idea of kind of people going to Australia is that um, you know, a lot of the time it was English versus Irish. It was, you know, there, there, there were kind of like different levels of oppression. Um, and so I think it's really smart that they kind of made her character. She She's oppressed by the English, by the upper class, by, you know, um, but she also is still higher than the indigenous people. There are, there are levels within all of this, but also that there were similarities between her character and the um, key indigenous character who, who, is called Billy in the film and that the two of them speak different languages. So she speaks uh, Gaelic and he speaks uh, what is what actually was created um, as a language now is called Palo Akani, which is a language that is put together 
based on many languages because there were at least maybe 11, I mean, no one knows for sure, but around 11 or so nations in Tasmania, um, all of which would have had different languages for, in their indigenous cultures. And from the records that exist, we we know some of the words. And so that this Palawakani language is, is kind of what's created and spoken now by the indigenous people who do live in Tasmania. And so giving life to that and letting that breathe through the film was also really important uh, for the filmmaker, but also the person. She was in consultation uh, with an Aboriginal consultant on this film, Jim Everett. She worked really close with him. He's a Tasmanian elder. Uh, he's also an artist, a poet and a writer. And, you know, it was really important that they put everything through the Tasmanian Aboriginal Commission, past Jim, past the producers, to make sure that those representations are really authentic. Um, and I think that that the reason the characters are so strong, and particularly the lead characters in this film, um, are so good, is because it's one, it's really well researched, um, which really does make it a kind of authentic account. And like you say, it's not a specific true story; it's based on. Um, various historical accounts, but it's very well researched in terms of like what a uh, fiction could be of that time. Um, and I think that that gives the character the ability, and I think the performance is fantastic as well, really gives her the ability to kind of draw the audience into her personal plight. So we really feel for her and her <laughs> story, but we also understand that it's a much more complicated system and that she is also um, uh, Im implicated, culpable, responsible, that everyone in this film is really responsible for upsetting uh, and, and, and kind of, I guess, colonizing this environment, these people, this whole nation. I mean, we also see different depictions of indigenous people in the film, which is very important too. They're not shown um, as sometimes it happens in cinema that there's this idea that there is like one type of Aboriginal person or one type of indigenous person um, to Australia and that that's the only person that you're ever presented with. But actually, of course, there were lots of different types of people at this period of time um, that, you know, trackers, people working for white people, people who were still in, you know, living in their tribes. Uh, and, and there's, you know, hundreds and th thousands actually of different tribes, um, cultures and communities. So I, I think the film does a really good job of trying to sort of bring that to the fore to address that. And I think that the characterization is really key because I think if you don't have that emotional pull to go on the journey with, um, then it becomes like a kind of history lesson. And, and and I don't think Jennifer Kent's doing that. I think she stays true to the history while creating a really deeply affecting drama. I mean, I, I literally could not agree with you more. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to talk to you um, in particular, because this is, this is part of the discourse that is going around, whether it is necessary to show this amount of violence, whether it's necessary to show sexual violence, uh, in particular, you know, the thing that is most talked about kind of in all of the reviews and the accounts that I've read of the film is obviously the multitude of rape scenes and the kind of sexual abuse that the lead character Claire is subjected to. And this kind of has a, a particular history within the genre, which has its own kind of name. I'm thinking specifically of rape revenge movies, which are a particular brand of exploitation films that usually use rape as a narrative device that sets off a character, usually a female character, on a revenge plot to punish um, the perpetrators. And it's it's not dissimilar to what Claire embarks on. She does embark on a journey of revenge and retribution against, in particular, kind of the British officer played by Sam Claflin, who is the not the only person who essentially systematically tortures her and her family, but is also kind of the embodiment of the the British power essentially in the film. If you think about if you think about every character as a composite of a much bigger structure and system. But what I wanted to talk specifically, kind of in the thing that is putting off a lot of people, and that was probably the cause of the of the really vitriolic initial response at the at the festivals where it first screened, was kind of how it deals with filming this amount of violence against a woman. Yes, I have multiple things to say about that. I guess the first thing I want to mention is that 
Uh, Jennifer Kent refuses to classify this film as a rape revenge film, which I think is interesting. Um, she she denies that it fits that category. I agree with you, actually. I think structurally it does, and I don't think that there's um, a problem with putting it into that tradition of filmmaking or referring to that tradition of filmmaking. Um, and people who are experts in that area, such as Alexandra Hella Nicholas, who's an Australian um, critic and academic, she definitely you know would also look at it from a rape revenge perspective. But Jennifer Kent's idea is that the violence in the film is necessary because it's part of the story. But also, and I think this is quite important, that we don't actually see um, very much of that rape. So, so, And there's something else I want to say after, but I'll come back to. But this idea of what we actually see, it's mostly close-ups of faces during the rape scenes. This is what I wanted uh, to talk to you about, actually, because I'm, I'm completely kind of with you. Because even though I reference rape revenge, I don't personally think it necessarily you can you kind of distance yourself from that category of films but because of the the structure of the narrative and the nightingale but at the same time I don't think it necessarily films precisely because of those visual decisions that Jennifer Kent made yeah so um the cinematographer that she worked with um he, a Polish cinematographer and uh, is that that they they really constantly we're talking about having the faces in the center of the frame um and and she talks about that being confrontive to confronting to watch emotionally and something that she's really proud of in the the way the film looks is that it constantly has these faces in the center of the frame and i think that's really key because of the themes of culpability responsibility and this idea of the face-to-face -face encounter and humanity and i think actually it's quite philosophical um is that she's thinking about what it means to face um, to face history, to face someone else and to face humanity. And so the way to tell that is through physically framing faces throughout the film. And so quite often this film works very much in close up with faces. And we really don't see the actual, um, I mean, the, the thing is, this is actually true of a lot of really brilliant Australian films. And, and I'm going to um, reference things like Warwick Thornton's Sweet Country, um, mm -hmm. but also even Snowtown from Justin Kurzel is that Quite often what seem like some of the most violent stories out of Australian um, filmmaking and the most violent films, if you actually really take the time to look at the violence in the film, there's a couple of minutes of screen violence in the entire thing. Um, and actually the violence is very cleverly done through the craft of filmmaking. So it's either through the kind of close up um, as it is in this film, in Jennifer Kent's um uh, her, her her film, I think, is really about the kind of close-up. Then if you look at Sweet Country, the rape scene actually in that film is done by the closing of windows and sound. Um, so we don't see the rape scene, but it's really violent and it feels violent. In Snowtown, all of the most violent scenes, including a rape, we see really only like from a distance, a door frame. Um, or, and the way he crafts it through there is very much through the sound design because there's this constant sound of squelching. Um, and that's through the kind of pushing of kangaroo heads in a bucket at the start of the film. We don't see it, but we hear it. This idea of slurping spaghetti whenever um, he's eating his meal. And then it kind of comes back to that same kind of sound of skin hitting skin in the rape scene, which is why it feels so violent, because by that point he's built up tension in the film. And I think Jennifer Kent does the same thing here. I think she's looking at showing that violence and not shying away from it. But, okay, so the thing that happens to a baby, for example, without, you know, saying too much about it, I don't physically see something bad happen to a child because um, obviously no child is hurt in the filmmaking. But the the way it's cut together, the sound, the sound is key, really key. Um, and the implication of what that means took place is actually more violent than seeing it. And actually, I would say in terms of violence against children in films, the reason it's more distressing in this film is because it's implied, because I have to imagine it happening. And that is worse. Like if you take a Serbian film where, I mean, they, you know, do something really horrendous to a doll, um, it's quite clearly a plastic doll. So even though you see more of it in a film like that than you do in a film like this, the violence is feel it feels more violent. Um, I think because implication says to us, it's like, you know, when we watch eyes without a face or the innocence compared to contemporary horror films that show a lot more gore, 
the inference of something means that you have to connect the dots in your own brain. And I think that that is far more distressing as a viewer um, than it is to kind of see something in its entirety. No, I mean, that's obviously not, I'm not saying that that means that real true violence that you would bear witness to is not worse. I just mean in terms of sewing together a kind of narrative conceit, I think it's actually really difficult for an audience member to make peace with that because it makes you feel, uh, it almost like it makes you feel unclean for having had the thought. Exactly. And because it puts, it puts the, in a way, the responsibility of creating and visualizing the whole, the most horrible thing you could imagine happening on the audience. So you're kind of creating the image in your head. The filmmaker is just implying that what is happening, but they're not actually giving you the image and kind of letting it stop at that. You are ultimately responsible for whatever image you're conjure up. Um, but, and I thought kind of from my point of view, kind of those scenes in particular where this is where I kind of uh, uh, would side with Jennifer Cannon in the regard that it doesn't necessarily feel unnecessary or exploitative because it's all on Claire's face and it's all about the experience of assault and the that pain and that the word I'm looking for is kind of the the endurance and the knowledge that mm. this is systemic and that is not the first time that that's happened and that is not the last time that it's happened and the fact that there are people there that can stop it and will not stop it yeah i i i mean i really think that is important and it kind of it makes me think actually as well so if you take a film like holiday by isabella eckloff where i actually think the rape scene in that is much more difficult to watch um but i would agree with the sentiment that both filmmakers kent and eckloff um when they say that it it has to be violent and it has to be uncomfortable to watch because violence against women violence against anyone rape is violent and horrible to watch like and and i think that's true is that you know there is and obviously there's something about the extent to which you show it but i think the key thing for me is that it's not shown for titillation um and it's not shown for viewer enjoyment because that would be much worse we're, we're quite comfortable with you know people don't have the same outrage as i i actually think they probably should for films like nine and a half weeks where he basically stalks her and forces her and violently forces her into um, sexual relationship with him. But that's seen as a romance film. Um, and, 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 you know, I think that, that everything in that film is shot and, and presented as if it were titillation and as if it were something inviting for us to enjoy watching. And I think that the key here is that, you know, it shouldn't be enjoyable to watch a rape scene and it shouldn't be enjoyable or comfortable to watch violence against other people. That absolutely is important that it is horrendous to watch because that that's the truth of that uh, event taking place. Exactly. And kind of to, to wrap that up as well as the fact that you cannot escape looking at her face while it's happening because of the way that she frames those scenes and that that violence is the fact that you cannot look away. Um, it's so confronting because there is no... You cannot set that up as a titillating shot. It's entirely about her experience and it can it's extremely confronting because of that because you cannot look away from what is happening but you don't need to see it to understand what is going on. You're entirely focused on the pain that she's going through and her subjective experience of it which is just as painful to endure um, as a viewer because it forces you to empathize with her. It allows at no point... I don't think it, it visually allows for anyone to take anything from it aside from the pain and the trauma of the experience, which is an extremely powerful tool that film has. And I think that Jennifer Kent has used it quite responsibly and understanding every single tool in her arsenal and what she wanted to say with those scenes. And that's where they felt necessary. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I mean, I really do think that, again, it comes back to, for me, what the subject matter is and what issues it's dealing with. And, you know, Australian history is incredibly violent and, and it is, it was a just, it's a distressing history to learn about. And I think that it's important that the film is distressing and shows that, I mean, it, you know, in recent years, we've seen a much better depiction, a much truer depiction of those events, things like sweet country that I mentioned before, um, because it used to be that these films were all kind of told from, 
white colonial points of view or these stories were often told. And, and I think it's also important that we start to see history rewritten by um, by indigenous filmmakers, also by women filmmakers, because um, other things happen to people and those stories just weren't told until these filmmakers have started to actually retell that history. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk about though, just to wrap this up is actually about the depiction of female rage in the film. Because after everything that she's subjected to and everything that happens to her family and how she confronts the authorities, Claire is, I hesitate almost to use the word possessed, but she does seem to kind of be completely overpowered by her own anger and grief and that uncontrollable mix of the two. So I wanted to see what your take was on how the film uses female rage as a as a powerful guiding force of the narrative, but also of the character. Yeah, I also thought that was extremely well done. Uh, I particularly like the fact that Kent makes sure that it's an embodied experience for Claire and that we understand it as an embodied experience, that, um, you know, it's not something that she sits down and thinks about. It's a physical, it's actually a physical violence and it's physical violence that happens to her, but also in the sense of, um, the baby and her her role as being a mother, um, things like how her 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 hormones and her body responds to what happens, um, the sequences where she kind of wakes up and you know she's got she's got p- pain and she's leaking her breast milk. I think that that's a really important part of telling this story because it it goes actually quite a long way to sort of explaining this physical embodiment of of being ripped apart from her family, of being torn away from a a physical part of herself. And because it is a part of herself that she loses um, at the start of the film and, and, and a very big part of herself that she loses. So I, I quite, I, I thought that was very well depicted. And I think that that, that rage, I mean, it's interesting to me that sort of like, I think that there's some law about, you know, uh, women who give birth, if they, they were to kill their partner, for example, in the first six months of their lives, um, the sentencing is really lenient on that because of the physical hormones and the, the, what happens to someone when they go through that process of having a a baby and, and bringing up a small child. And so given that she's in the first few months of having had a baby, when all of this takes place, um, and given what physically that is tearing for, away from her, um, I actually thought that the depiction of female rage was really right on. I felt, I, I mean, I was so incredibly uh, empathetic towards her and I, I, I felt her rage watching it. Um, and I also felt, I also felt the, 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 you know, the complication of her character not being 100% because she's also not 100% great. She does things that are not perfect. So, but I also really appreciated that. And I thought that, I mean, I really have to say, I thought Jennifer Kent did a fantastic job um, right across the board with this film in terms of depicting the events, the history, the rage, the characters, um, the emotion and the confrontation that the story needed to evoke. Yeah, I'm completely with you. I think I, we need to stop agreeing on things. <laughs> I'll let you go now, but um, thank you so much for jumping in and talking about the film with me for a little while. Is there anything that you want to pluck that you're doing? I, I've made a short video essay about The Nightingale um, and uh, written a little text to go along with it, which is um, which you can find on the Watershed's website. What's your name again? Claire. Your island. Thank you so much for, well, for sharing the time, but also for your amazing performance. I'm actually quite sad to have watched the film on a link because I think it's going to be absolutely stunning on the big screen. But I wanted to kind of first talk to you about not the process of getting the role, but the preparation process. Mm. Um, Between getting the role and actually starting filming, nine months um, passed. And within that time, I basically watched every documentary I could find about sexual violence or violence against women. Um, And I read, obviously, history books to give myself um, an idea of the historical context for the film. But I also educated myself a lot on PTSD 
and worked with a clinical psychologist who had worked with Jennifer from, you know, the beginning of writing the script and who was also there with us on set um, during the more harrowing days. Um, And working with her was absolutely fascinating because one of the things that I really, really wanted to portray accurately was the journey through the PTSD. I find that a lot of films, when they portray a um, traumatic event, they kind of forget about the um, post-traumatic stress disorder um, that people have to deal with frequently for life, actually. Um, And it felt extra important to do that after the traumatic event, in this case being one of sexual violence and rape. Um, I feel like people really forget about that aspect of it in film, particularly. Um, So yeah, and and, and with this um, clinical psychologist, Dr. Elaine Bard is her name, she's amazing. She um, facilitated me meeting victims of rape and um social workers uh in uh, domestic abuse centers and that was a very humbling uh, experience and and kind of it, it was amazing that these women were so generous and in, in sharing their stories with me and it gave me obviously a huge well of empathy to pull from when I was filming those scenes but also it gave me a huge sense of responsibility too you know I, I really wanted to really be as vulnerable and fragile as possible and and just kind of (laughs) bear my soul to give us truthful a performance not just for the story's sake but also to kind of honor the people who had helped me and in and and who were so generous to share their stories so yeah there was a lot and then there was a practical point of view where I had to learn how to horse ride and load and shoot a musket and wood chop and all that stuff but as you say the majority of the work went into just really getting the psychology of um Claire when you mentioned it a little bit briefly, but I'd like to get dig into it a bit. Kind of, was there anything that you wanted to be particularly careful about portraying? It's quite interesting, I think, in general, when you see women on screen kind of react to uh, any form of abuse, but particularly sexual abuse. Kind of, there is an, a quite perversive narrative about a right kind of victim, mm-hmm. which then can influence, can help people talk or write or direct those scenes or those characters. And I thought it was really fascinating with the Nightingale because it is so harrowing, but her reaction feels so visceral. And then the journey, the majority of the journey is her kind of dealing with that trauma. So was there anything that you particularly wanted to make sure to give that earnesty or that kind of seriousness seriousness I mean, to all of it to be honest with you um I think that's why I was so keen I wrote to Jennifer like begging her to give me this role and I told her I would give her everything and you know she she held me to that but I think the two of us really really wanted to portray this accurately and truthfully and you know you can't tell th- this story you can't tell the story of a convict woman in Tasmania you can't tell the story of the aboriginal people in Tasmania and shy away from this it would be a disservice I think to pretend that these things didn't happen to these women obviously men too but largely women at the time and and you know it's it's a part of their narrative and I think to kind of just gloss over it or desensitize it or just allude to it actually it does a disservice into shining a light on what it really is like for these victims and of course there are people people just in general but also victims who have found it a little bit too much and have found it too triggering but we've also had victims come up to us afterwards and thank us for showing the PTSD for showing you know the emotional damage I had a woman come up to me after a screening in LA and say to me as a victim of sexual abuse I feel understood after watching this film and that is really powerful and just because something is too much for one person it doesn't mean that someone else can't find something very comforting in it but obviously you know we knew that there was a huge responsibility in showing this on screen and I think Jen is just so sensitive um and really intelligent and also very very responsible and you know you never it's all from Claire's perspective it's all from the female perspective it's always on her face or Hawkins's face you never see skin you never see nudity you never see two bodies in frame or rarely um and so it really was about you know it it, we didn't want it to feel in any way like a brutal sex scene uh, or a sex scene of any kind we wanted to show that this is a, a, um, a weapon of violence you know it's no surprise that rape and war go hand in hand it's a tool of um domination destruction and um to kind of keep the powerful in power and it was important that instead of showing it as something being done to a body that it was a crime being committed against a human being you know we really wanted to make sure that the human being element 
um, was um, powerfully portrayed. And I, I really do believe that we did that. And honestly, I think that that's why people find it so difficult to watch. Yeah. Because you can't disengage. And there's quite a few very powerful, tiny details that are kind of the dehumanizing methods as well that yeah. the soldiers use against Claire and her husband and her baby. Yeah. You know, even when they refer to the baby as it. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about you know, your working method with Jennifer? And kind of what was she, what was it like with her, working with her as a director, particularly kind of considering both of your sense of repos- responsibility towards the subject matter? I mean, Jen is just completely uncompromising on things that shouldn't be compromised on. Uh, first and foremost, it's about truthful performance and authenticity. Uh, and also Jen had researched this for like five years. She also had an Aboriginal advisor on board throughout the whole process because not only did she want, obviously... You know, she's a white woman, so telling Claire's story, obviously she had a certain perspective, but she was also hypersensitive to the fact that we were setting this against the backdrop of the backdrop of the Black War. And so she wanted to make sure that we had a very sensitive telling of also the Aboriginal plight and the almost, you know, well, the attempt at genocide there. So she's just the kind of director that on all sides has thought of everything and it wants to be as honorable as possible. Um, luckily we were both on the same page pretty much about everything and also given the fact that she'd worked with this clinical psychologist from the very beginning she was very particular about what she wanted I mean it was a lot of the work was done in the script honestly Mm -hmm. but she was also great about giving us whatever we needed on set you know there were times when I needed to beat up like boxing pads to Mm -hmm. kind of get my performance up or you know little some of the things that I love most about the film are like little things that I think would only come from a female writer like you Mm -hmm. know with Claire when her breasts are leaking and the pain of not only the physical pain of that not being able to express but also the reminder that her baby is no longer with her you know little tiny things that I mm-hmm. think wouldn't necessarily come through had a male written it um but so yeah when she would basically we just did whatever we could to make every moment as um I, I keep using this word but it was the most important thing about the mm-hmm. film truthful yeah um and not to shy away from the fact that you know Claire would have had nightmares hallucinations um would have you know at some points been suicidal or snapped out at lashed out at Billy um you know it's it's all all part of the PTSD and and also her having been a product of her time too in a film full of extremely challenging scenes kind of from violence being perpetrated against Claire but also Claire perpetrating violence herself Mm -hmm. what was the most challenging one for you I mean definitely the scene in the hut is it was just like it destroyed all of us everyone on set um we had like big strong strapping aussie crewmen in the room just in tears you know but we were you know we did it very safely and we all knew each other very well by that point and we could kind of support each other through it um so no one ever felt that they're being taken advantage of in any way um but also that scene where she commits the violence too you know mm. it's i think frequently you know, when the character gets the revenge, it's like, oh, there we go, story ended. And it's just, it doesn't work that way. It's actually so much harder. Mm. No one is programmed to take the life of someone else. And no matter how much Claire thinks it's going to make her feel better, it just, it doesn't. And she goes down the route of an eye for an eye and it it almost destroys her, you know. And and it was really important that we show that. We wanted to show that, you know, it's, if you, if you go down this path, it's not going to end well for anyone. It'll only just keep perpetuating this circle of violence. And it's only through her beautiful, slowly developed relationship with um, Billy, you know, the fact that he can just look at her as like a human being. It doesn't even have to be love. It doesn't have to be, you know, best pals, just mm. basic human respect. You're a human being. I'm going to respect your, your, your being. <laughs> um, and it's through that she's, that she's able to kind of choose a different path, one of empathy, despite everything pushing her to do something else and and it's ultimately through that that she kind of saves herself and wants to keep going so talk to me about kind of that that relationship as well both on screen and um um as performers as well kind of how did you build that rapport um well bakley and i were down there quite a bit earlier than everyone else um bakley amazingly had, had never acted before and so Jen was very keen that um, we form a relationship, not only just to make sure that he was compliment, co- comfortable in acting, but also, you know, we have to say, well, I particularly have to say some pretty awful things to him. <laughs> so she wanted to make sure that we were really good friends beforehand and that he knew that it was obviously all just in the performance and he could trust me. And um, we just got on like a house on fire instantly. He's a really lovely guy um, with the most amazing sense of humor and laugh. Um, and then obviously on screen, it just... Um, Jen kind of led the way on that too you know it was his first time acting so 
she would guide him she's an amazing actress director and obviously mm. he has a well of raw talent but I think as well having Jen be your first director is pretty pretty lucky it's um yeah can you talk a little bit about the journey of Claire kind of because she can be especially with Billy towards the beginning she's quite dehumanizing quite mean towards him as well mm-hmm. and kind of in her endless pursuit of um of vengeance the the truth of it is if you want to see like a, this idea of like a strong female character one of the things about Claire that I love is that she is a human being with her flaws and her prejudices and especially of being that you know being from that time I've heard a couple of people say oh like this film is so racist she's so racist towards him and you go yes she is racist towards him at the beginning because she would have been a racist and because she was a product of her time and it's inexcusable but through this slow relationship that they form she realizes oh I was completely prejudiced and you know everything I my assumptions about the way that the world works and the way that I should think about certain people it was completely wrong Mm -hmm. but you can't show that development if it doesn't start at a place of her you know being ignorant Mm -hmm. um so I think it's you know it's important that you show that journey of her changing and if you're going to tell a story about oppression it's hard to tell that properly and truthfully without showing the oppressor you know um so that was one aspect the idea of rape revenge movies um, I mean I think ours is different I think on Mm -hmm. paper I can see why people say that it is a rape revenge movie but frequently in rape revenge movies there's a rape it's treated as Uh, a moment in time for the story it's a plot point and then she moves on to the revenge part and that's just not how it works in real life you Mm -hmm. know frequently apart from the fact that these women would have had to endure it time and time and again um that was just the way that the time was for them you know as I said before it's the it's the journey of PTSD and how it's something that they have to deal with frequently for the rest of their life and I think that we really honor that side of the story she doesn't doesn't turn into you know a Kill Bill style thing where she just gets her revenge in a really cool way you know it, it and it apart from anything on top of that is the added layer of it's actually really 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 difficult to get your revenge and sometimes it doesn't give you what you want um in return sometimes it can make you feel worse and so so that was one thing that was important and another thing that I I just like to kind of talk about mm-hmm. is you know I've heard people say oh like do we really need another rape scene in 2019 and my attitude is, okay, fair enough. We've seen so many rape scenes depicted incorrectly and irresponsibly on mm-hmm. screen. But it's a, first of all, it's a, it's too reductive a comment to talk about. You know, people say, oh, it's usually a plot point for a woman to find her strength. And I think that that's a pretty reductive way of looking at women's strength and also rape. You know, why, it, Claire, they say to me, oh, Claire is, Claire is, you know, meek beforehand and then she finds her strength after the rape. And I completely disagree with that. She, at the beginning, is enduring what so many women, and men, but so many women and Aboriginal women at the time as well, um, have had to endure. They had to endure. It was a part of their life. Mm -hmm. That frequently they had to endure it, not because they were weak, but they had to endure it because, like with Claire, they're protecting a hope of a future. They're protecting their family. She's protecting her child. If that's not strong, I don't know what the hell is. It's just that endurance, because it's a quiet form of steady, resilient strength, it doesn't seem like the big, brashy, you know, which clearly she has, because you see that then afterwards she pulls out this amazing vengeful strength that's you know Mm. fueled by rage but it's too reductive a narrative to say that it's what makes her find a strength and I don't think that anyone could really argue that well I I certainly can't see how you can argue that rape is something that makes someone strong it seems like a very skewed narrative so I can understand why people are wary of it because it's been shown so many times irresponsibly on screen but to to not acknowledge that this is a part of what certainly of this story at 1825 in Tasmania was absolutely something that Aboriginal women and and the convict women would have had to deal with Mm. but even now today and I think you can't tell that story and 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 just turn a blind eye to that that was a part of their narrative and it would be completely disingenuous and I think dishonorable and disrespectful to not acknowledge it and show it for what it what it really was no I completely agree and I really like the point that you make about kind of the the idea of endurance of not being recognized as strength because Mm -hmm. it's also you know if you endure if you're resilient which is an attribute that often falls on women Mm -hmm. because it's not showy it's not seen as strength because it's not over the top or it's you know it's as if talking about introverted people versus extroverted people Mm -hmm. you know it's the same kind of thing it doesn't mean that it's better or worse is just a different version of power yeah. and of strength and frequently it was for for the benefit of someone else which again is something mm-hmm. else that women have to do a lot of the time you know it's it's for the benefit of someone else for the benefit mm-hmm. of protecting someone else to bring back a little bit because it does feel very much kind of 
of the time now like it feels like a conversation that is really happening in the open right now and the scene that really struck me actually that harkened back to kind of a lot of conversations that are happening kind of on a much bigger scale is actually the scene where she tries to denounce the crime when she goes to the authorities and she's completely rejected mm. and she's sort of mocked and she says oh we'll file and he says we'll file a report yeah which is the most obnoxious triggering yeah. thing yeah. um can you you've mentioned says, where's your proof while she's holding yeah. her dead baby you know exactly yeah. and it's kind of the burden of proof being put upon her. the victims yeah. um or survivors of sexual assault in particular and women very often so can you can you talk a little bit about what not not just the kind of the reaction or the expectation of people against uh, for this film but how do you think it kind of offers an additional commentary to something that is still extremely prevalent and very current I think, well, one of the things I hope people take from this film is, unfortunately, as difficult as it is to watch, and, you know, sometimes where people get angered by being made to feel things they don't want to feel, but I think it's really important that people see just how truly horrendous it is a thing to do to someone and how how, how damaging it is and not to just gloss over it and, you know, talk about it only in theory but not really know what it does. As you say, you know... <laughs> kind of this idea of victim blaming is 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 uh yeah it's 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 rampant obviously um but i think but i think to be honest it plays into this whole idea as well of like the roles of women and how and how they they play into certain things you can even see it in the story actually you know luddy the cook uh, um not luddy the cook mm -hmm. she thinks that claire is playing up to the yeah you yeah. know so it's it's a, it's a it's a societal thing not just only a men towards women thing oh, it's absolutely. also something that yeah. can happen with women too mm. so i think it sheds light on that but another way i think the story is really relevant is you know the fear of the other in a time when people are becoming increasingly um anti-immigration or you know wanting to make keep things whether they are in the status quo i think it's it's really really relevant for that and how you know you don't have to love others you don't have to love strangers that you don't know but at least respecting that they are a human being and respecting a human life and I think that empathy is kind of a, a devaluing currency unfortunately and I think we're trying to say with our film that it's it's really the only thing that's going to save us from ruin yeah and it's it's interesting that you bring up empathy because that's the other kind of big theme that I saw in the film obviously it's it's an exploration of violence in many forms and not just a kind of the effect that it has on violence but the mechanisms of it both you know in those scenes uh, with the cook um, and kind of the verbal abuse that she endures and the continuous systemic abuse that also the Aboriginal peoples endure in the film. But it's it's so difficult to portray empathy on screen. And I wanted to kind of go back to something you mentioned earlier about the way that Jennifer filmed particular scenes and particularly kind of some of the stylistic choices that she made. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of how um, a couple of those details perhaps and kind of how some of those choices reflected then in the in the sensitivity or the empathetic approach to the story um, a lot of it was I mean I think actually one of the main things is that Jen chose academy ratio for a very specific reason you know it's really it lends itself very very well to human faces well faces in general but like obviously faces <laughs> um, and I think that's a huge part of why you're able to connect so well with the characters because we're right up in their faces and you're connecting with their eyes all the time. And I mean, obviously I hope that I can do a good job, but someone like, you know, all the characters, but like with Bakley, for example, I mean, Bakley has just this beautiful, soulful face and that does, you know, it, it shines in, in, in the Academy ratio. And there were just little moments like, um, it's, it's mostly just in little looks, I think, because, you know, Billy and Claire were never really going to become fast furious friends it just it's not that kind of time it wasn't it that's not the setting for it but they they grow to really care for each other and respect each other and you know and, and just in little things like you know he he helps her firstly mm -hmm. after at a, even after he doesn't have to you know when when she when he comes across her after the scene with Jago <laughs> you know and he has every right to think I'm with a crazy person I need to leave he sees her pain and thinks okay I'm gonna I'm gonna choose to help you because I see that you're in pain you know the or or the scene around the campfire where they can empathize with each other they realize oh I'm you're not actually what I thought you were just little moments it's all mm. in the little moments what did you think when you first saw the finished film the first thing I did was I went into the bathroom and I cried from relief just that it was like done because this <laughs> film has taken a long time um 
you know, I, I, I auditioned in the February of 2016 and I got it in the June. Then we filmed in the March of 17, finished in the July. It was another year before it was in the edit, mm. finished in the edit. So it was like a long, I couldn't believe that we'd actually finally got a finished product. Um, and I was really proud of it. I, I mean, I wasn't surprised at how confronting it is. I mean, it's in the mm. script, it's in the story. So that was not a shock to me. But I was just really proud of what we'd done, you know, from, from ca- really from cast to crew to production. Everyone was on this film because they felt like it was important and everyone gave their heart and souls to it. And I, I was just really proud that we had got a finished product that we could be proud of and that set, tried to just say something instead of being just mindless entertainment. You know, it, I think it really tries to say something and it sparked different reactions. And I think that that's, mm. to be honest, <laughs> more and more. Now it's hard to find films that aren't just trying to please everybody and make loads of money. Um, and I think that Jen is really brave in trying to tell this story in the honest way that she has and that it's really for the power of the message rather than for anything else. They close. (laughs) What are you doing? (laughs) I don't want no trouble. I'll sell my rock, I'll sell my real. 